Greg Sheldon here, your host of Metal Steel Manufacturing and Business Pro Podcast, where you learn everything about the metals and manufacturing industry that make your modern day life possible. Hello, folks. Greg Sheldon here. Welcome to this show. Uh, today we have Rocky Lalvani. Uh, I pronunciate that right on the show, actually. And uh, we, he, he comes from Profit First. And what Profit First is is a little bit of a different system on the way you structure your finances to um, bring Profit First. So <clears throat> we talk about that. We talk a lot about financials because, you know, that's important to business, as you know. And we discuss the difference between, you know, well, not even the difference, but the, what, how revenue and profit are related. And they don't always correlate. We talk about you know many of the things in the on the financial statements that are connected not connected what they mean and benchmarks to be looking for so i believe this is a good introduction to why financials are important coming from uh, rocky um, with his extensive experience in consulting when it comes to the financial end of things and he loves financials just like i do so i hope you can pull a lot from this and uh he um, is, you know, well, at the end of the episode, you can find it where, where he is and reach out to him, or certainly I am available at any time for financial advisory. So thank you so much, Rocky. Uh, you, um, you know, it was, it was a great episode for me to learn a lot of things and hear about what's happening in the industry and, and others that, uh, you know, is something we all need to think about. So Thank you for shining a light on that. And to the listeners, thank you. Subscribe, please. Share with your friends, families, and colleagues. And uh, without any further delay, Rocky Lalvani. Good morning, everybody. Greg Sheldon here. Today we have Rocky Lalvani. Is that how I pronounce it, Rocky? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, you know, I always want to double check, right? So... Um, Rocky is a business consultant, um, and he utilizes the Profit First system. And I believe, how are you associated with uh, the Profit First system, Rocky? So I'm one of Mike's Profit First professionals. So okay. he has an entire system to train, to certify, and to upkeep all of us and make sure that we're living up to the standards. And so I've gone through all of that. Well, that's good. That's good. So what got you? Well, let's start with what is Profit First, you know, so the listeners can understand what we're talking about. There's the book in the background there, and I've read the book as well. It's been a couple years since I read it, but, you know, be a refresher for me and the, and maybe a first for everybody else. So. so Profit First is a cash flow system. It's designed for entrepreneurs by an entrepreneur. Unfortunately, most of the accounting systems are designed for tax purposes. They're designed for other purposes. They're not designed to help you to be profitable. And that's one of the struggles I think many business owners have is how do I become more profitable? And most business owners aren't spending their time doing accounting. They're not looking at their accounting software. They're looking at their bank balance. They look at their bank balance, they make decisions, and they move forward. And that's literally what Profit First is designed for. It's designed to take the habits you have today and to utilize them in an appropriate way to help you run your business. I think one of the things that Mike realized after um, – so I'll tell Mike's story. I mean – Mike is a serial entrepreneur. He had some companies, had the wonderful exits, walked away with a lot of money. He thought he was the smartest business guy in the world. And, you know, a couple of years later, reality struck and, and all that money was gone to the point they're coming for the keys to the house and the car. And during that period, he's like, how did I get this route so wrong? How did I mess this up? Like, what happened? And he realized we're all using the wrong formula for profit. Everyone's told sales minus expenses equals profit, which makes profit a leftover, an afterthought. And Mike said, we've got it wrong. It should be sales minus profit equals expenses. So we take our profits first and we constrain our spending. And the reality is for most businesses, that's the biggest problem. 
we spend too much money. Yeah, yeah. So so really, I guess it's a budgeting system, kind of? It's not really a budgeting system in the sense that there's no budget per se. It's more of a constraint and a give every dollar a job system. So basically the way it works, your money comes in and we have an account where all the money comes in. This way it's easy to see how much money came in. That's our income account. And then from our income account, we allocate money to where it's appropriate. So clearly we allocate money to profit. We allocate money to the owner's pay because most owners pay themselves last. And then we allocate money to taxes. So when tax time comes, we can stroke a check. It gets yeah. rid of all that fear and anxiety. And then what's left over is, is allocated to operating expenses. So now you know how much you truly have to spend on your operating expenses within your company. And you just live within that. Yeah, okay. So it's a way to show the business owner, okay, this is the profit I want. And then this is what's left to go towards um, X, Y, and Z. So how does somebody go about separating those things within their business? When you say separate, you mean? Yeah, like, so you've got your profit. You've just you've, you've decided I want 10% profit, right? Let's just use that as a number. And then I've got, you know, I've got 5% go towards, oh, well, that's a pretty low number. Let's say 25% <laughs> goes towards expenses. You know, 50% goes towards cost of goods sold. Um, how do you allocate those in the in the system you're talking about? So basically, that's exactly what you do. When the money comes in, you take the money from that income account and you put it in a separate bank account with that particular name on it. So there's a bank account for profit, a bank account for tax, a bank account for your operating, and you move the money to all of those. Okay. Okay. And so do you find, you know, when you're talking with clients or potential clients, you know, what is their, how is it, how well is it received this system? So it kind of depends. It depends on who we're talking to. It, 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 people look at it very different ways. I will tell you that hundreds of thousands of business owners use this system. They have had tremendous success with it. It works. Sometimes they get pushback from the bank. Sometimes they get pushback from their accountants or their bookkeepers. But once we get through all of that and they do it, it works. However, you have to keep at it and you have to keep making changes. In the book, Mike gives you targets. So he tells you, hey, for a business of your size, this is what we think a good target is. Mm -hmm. And business owners have to work towards making those changes to be more profitable. So it, it's designed to force you to think about your business, to think about your spending, and to think about how to be more resourceful in your company rather than just what we all do, which is to spend money all the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what do you find when it comes to education around um, the financials in the businesses? Like uh, you said earlier, you know, people look at, you know, what's in the bank account. And, you know, do you believe that that's enough information to operate a business well? No, but it's a first step, right? That's the reality of it. I think the goal here is at least to get you in and moving towards the right direction. Um, I, I don't think it's an end all be all, but for the business owner that's struggling or that doesn't have as much time to focus on this, it, it's kind of forcing the actions to take place. Now, once you get the system started in the basics, I think a big part of it is looking at all the different areas where your spending is going on and then making wise decisions there. So a lot of times we find that business owners sign up for all these different services, all these different softwares, and they're not even aware that they're still paying for it and they stopped using it. Right. So I think part of it is that part of the what Mike talks about in the book is to do an expense audit 
In other words, go through all of your spending and ask yourself, is this actually useful Mm -hmm. and is it productive and does it help me to generate more revenue and does it help me to be more profitable? Too often we spend money on what we call vanity items. You know, oh, that looks nice or I need this or more often than not, you don't need half of that stuff. That's right. And so part of it is to actually challenge yourself. Do I need this? Is this appropriate spending or is this inappropriate? And then make those hard decisions and make the cuts. Yeah. 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 I've definitely seen many examples in my career where, you know, and this is in the manufacturing and trades and a lot of the owners would, you know, buy a big fancy truck and put rims on it, lift it up and all of that silliness. I mean, it's not silly to them, but to me it is. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe that money could be spent in a better place. You know, Well, does that drive more clients? Does it drive more revenue? No. I mean, it, it's ego spending and we get it. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying life and to do that. But understand what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, yeah, and you say the ego. I think the ego is a big thing when it comes to business owners. I mean, a lot of them are those personalities of that's what got them there, right? Was having that big personality, that drive, that push. Um, and those are going to be some of the listeners. And I w- I'm wondering, you know, what is it that gets through to these guys to say, oh, maybe I need to be thinking about things a little bit differently? Because I would think, and I, and I just because I read the book, I know that it's a different way of thinking. How does somebody get past the um, point of struggle to think differently? Do they have to hit like a rock bottom or go out of business? Or I mean, what is it in your experience? (laughs) And that's a good question. I I think everyone's a little different. For some of the people, yeah, they have to hit rock bottom. For some people, it's just an awareness issue. Like they just weren't aware that that's what was happening. And for a lot of them, I think the problem is the accountants are always backward looking and business owners are forward looking. So they can't get the information they want. I think a lot of times it's, it's actually, oh my God, I've been looking for this. Thankfully, now I finally found something that makes sense to me. And I I think that's part of it is that most of the things that are out there don't make sense to the business owner. They're either too complicated or they're giving them old information that's no longer relevant. Right. And so one of the cool things about Profit First is you you can use it to help yourself pencil out what does the future look like and then ask yourself, does this work? Does it not? And I think that's one of the biggest things Profit First does. When people look at things in this way and they start to pencil it out, they'll realize, wait a minute, this business idea doesn't make sense or this business area is not profitable. Yeah. And then they they challenge it. Now, at that point, you've got a couple of choices, right? You can either charge a higher price. You can find a more resourceful way to run your business or just change the way that you think and look at the business differently mm-hmm. and find another way. And I think most people are smart enough to do that. They just need to be forced to do it. And I think that's part of what Profit First does is force you to behave a certain way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well said. So pricing, you say that and you know everybody's, ah, what are you talking about? I can't raise my prices. And um, I'm wondering what your rebuttal to that would be. What, why would somebody raise their price? Um, and what are the effects of that? Well, so I think we're in a different time. First of all, right now with inflation, everybody's raising prices. So I think that is one of the things you need to be aware of. What are your input prices and what does that look like? Everyone is always trying to push prices down. And I get that. The question is, how did you come up with your price to begin with, right? And then what type of business are you in? So if you're in a commodity business and you don't have pricing power, you have to ask yourself, how do I get pricing power? So is my pricing power come because I can do it fast? Does my pricing power come because I can do it better? 
And those are the things that I think you need to think through because you can pull different levers to be able to do that. Now, you may look at your business and you do, it doesn't matter. Let's just say you do 10 different things. Sure. You might come to find out out of the 10 things you do, one of them is super profitable. And so we'll literally tell business owners, shut down the other nine. Do the one thing that's super profitable because that's less work, more money. Why are you doing the other nine? Let go of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, some of them can be a loss leader, right? You know, they maybe they get you in the door. But again, back to your point, I, I agree. There's sometimes we need to sit down and think about how are we going to add value in a different way that nobody else is doing? And it's funny, I'm putting together and part of a group of, you know, consultants that do this stuff, right? On a, on a daily basis where we come up with market dominating positions, unique selling propositions for business owners. Um, because you can, comp- competing on price is, is impossible. I mean, it's not impossible. Mm-hmm. Everybody does it, but I mean, it, 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 it makes profit hard, right? So I think that's brilliant combined with the profit first strategy, where if you can be unique in the marketplace, you can you know, set your pricing higher. And then if you're taking that, look at, I need this amount of profit. And then the rest of it comes after. I think that's a brilliant combination. So. And I think many times business owners are doing business. They're not taking the time to realize, wait a minute, the more of this I sell, the less money I make, or I actually lose money. They're getting a thousand cuts over time. And if they don't have clarity on that, yeah. They're going to consistently struggle. They're like, why am I selling more and more and losing more and more? It's because yeah. you haven't taken the time to sit down and do the math and make sure that everything is appropriately priced and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. I would also add that, you know, some of the listener, I mean, as a business, you know, at some point they all want to sell their business, right? Mm-hmm. And I would say you know, if I'm coming in to look at a business to buy, I want to see that there's systems in place, right? So maybe this, some business owners listening aren't interested in, um, in, aren't interested in this because they can't see the long-term plan, but the long-term plan could be, well, you're, when you want to sell your business someday, you have this profit first system in place, that you know shows that profit every month do you think that that's a fair statement um for bringing value to a company when it's ready to sell it does a couple things it does it creates transparency because it becomes easier to see the flow of money through the company so somebody comes in they can see oh this is all the money coming in and they can see it in one account They can see how you put profit aside. They can see how you took owner's pay. They can see your taxes and then they can see your spending and they're all segregated and it's easier. So I think that builds trust. Yes. And because you're profitable, you're going to get a higher dollar amount on the sale. And so I think it does both of those things. Number one, it makes you more profitable. So it makes you more valuable. And then it shows and proves that you're actually able to do this and they can see the flow of money through the bank account so they can watch the cash go through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one of the things we do, let's face it, a lot of business owners will stuff expenses into their business. Sure. And that's fine. I'm not going to object to that. What we tell them to do is to stuff it into the owner's pay account. So that this way you can show somebody buying your business. Hey, I stuffed all this stuff into my business. It's actually money that you can take and do with as you choose. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, it creates another level of clarity. And it helps the business owner realize how much they're really getting from their business as a benefit. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Sellers, discretionary earnings, but sometimes it's so... uh, mixed up in everything that yeah that's really smart yeah thank you for that 
Um, so that transparency, I think that's really brilliant. Also, the speed of trust. If anybody hasn't written that, read, uh, read that book. It's a brilliant book because um, trust is so important. And there's, I think, we're really lacking that today in our um, economy. You know, in many corporations. Um, do you believe, I mean, that transparency, I agree with you, but have you, have you got clients that are sharing that throughout the organization with everybody? Would that be a good or a bad idea? So that depends. Um, we have some clients who, who do share it throughout the company and we have others that don't. Uh, and I think one of the driving forces is how profitable you are. If you're tight to margins, they're more apt to share right. because they're sharing with employees. Hey, you think we're making all this money. Let me show you. We're not right. right. And let me show you how it's disappearing because yeah. I don't think employees are not of the mindset to save money for the company. They're not usually rewarded for saving money for the company. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things we tell people, you know, if you want to have a profit sharing plan, this allows you to have a profit sharing plan. It puts the money aside to pay people and it starts the conversations. Hey, every time we spend a dollar, it's a dollar that coming out of profit, which means you're going to get less money. Yeah. And so it's changing the employee's mentality as well, because let's face it, I don't care if you're the business owner or the worker. We all spend too much and we all throw money at problems instead yes. of trying to figure a better way out. And so you've got to change the culture to reward good financial sense. But unfortunately, it, it's not a prevalent concept everywhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, do you think that education like financial education like this or other things would be beneficial within an organization and maybe you could gamify it somehow but what are your thoughts on that like do you think people would receive that like employees or whoever management I, I think people will receive it if they can have agency to do something about it okay if they're given rewards for it like at the end of the day if I'm going to work harder and help you become more wealthy, what's my cut? I mean, let's face it. What's in right. it for me, right? Yeah, of course. And so I think you need to create that culture. Okay. Okay. And you need to teach, teach people because I don't think people are aware. Most people aren't right. financially literate. And so they just don't even have the awareness to know that. And I think that is a big part of it. When business owners actually show them now you're in the, especially in your area, because if people make a mistake in what they do in, in creating a job, a lot of money can go to waste and scrap. Sure and can. people don't understand that and they don't realize the impact of that. So I think that's a big awareness thing, showing people what is the consequence of their actions Mm -hmm. And how it impacts not only the company, but everything else. People have no idea where their paycheck comes from. Like right. they just don't get it. And so you do have to teach that. Yeah, absolutely. And and there's, there's always this sentiment around, oh, the owners and the management, mainly the owners are, oh, they're making so much money. And, you know, but it, that is very rare, you know, and typically from what I've seen in my experience, they don't start the business for that reason. You know, they think it's an ego thing, right? They start it because I can do it better than my boss did and I'll have some freedom. And I don't believe that's how it always works out. Do you think the profit first system can help alleviate, you know, free up some time for these guys so that, you know, they can work on the, uh, the things that they enjoy instead of focusing on in the business stuff versus on, you know? And we talk about that. I think that is a, it's a principle that's baked into profit first, but it's not obvious, right? right? It's not that, that front line. It, it, it's not that clarity. But when we talk to business owners, that's a big part of what we talk about is working on the business instead of in the business. Yeah. When you truly implement profit first, 
and you you start using those guiding principles, what you're doing is instead of throwing money at every problem, you're thinking through the problem. What caused it? How do we fix it? What's the best way to solve this problem without just spending money? Because that's usually what most people do. They don't think about it. They just throw money at it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. Um, I had a point there. This happens to me every time. And then I forgot what it was. <laughs> Literally every episode. Um, so so what are you seeing out there? Because you talk to people uh, every day. You know, I mean, obviously revenue and profits and all that stuff is important. What other things are we seeing with your clients and businesses in North America that's a big issue right now? So number one, by far, is labor, right? Everyone is struggling with this issue of finding good workers and of retaining them and also of being able to afford them. I mean, wages, especially at the lower end of the curve, have dramatically gone up. I think we're, we're seeing a lot of our business owners having to pay over the last two, three years, 10, 20, 30 percent more per hour to to keep their people. Mm -hmm. um, they're seeing others trying to steal their people, essentially. Yep. So I think that's a big issue. Supply chains have been a big issue. Uh, along with that, shipping was a massive issue, depending on where your stuff is coming in from. Mm -hmm. That seems to have, it, it's settling more now. I think um, things are a little bit running more smoothly, not saying back to what they were, but more smoothly. Raw material costs are still increasing. If you're heavily dependent on fuel, those costs are increasing. So I, I think understanding what your input prices are and making sure that you're appropriately raising prices to cover that. Yeah. Um, if you're not, you're going to be in trouble. And, and that's just the reality of it. So I think those are some of the bigger issues that everyone is seeing. And then now we're starting to see increases in the cost of borrowing. If you're locked and loaded, it's fine. But if you're trying to borrow for new today, that's considerably causing uh, pullback. So yeah, that I, as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're seeing um, 8%. You know, I mean, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of interest on your money. It is. It will suck up your margins very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> will. Um. So, so these people. I mean, and this is, you know, and I agree with you. This is what I hear everywhere too. It's the people. What do you think? I believe it starts with leadership and I believe it starts with management. And, you know, I mean, we all have to take responsibility for these things. Um, how can that within an organization from leadership or ownership or whatever you want to call it, start to engage the people to keep the people to attract new um, talent? That all comes down to culture. Every company has a culture whether you created it intentionally or not is up to you. Now, once you have a culture, the question is, do you hire to culture? In other words, are you creating a system that attracts the people you want? Because if you're just hiring people for an hourly wage or they're just coming for the next you know, bump in wage, you're going to struggle. And also, let's face it, we all have those people in our company that cause more trouble than they're worth. But too often, if we're just hiring to a position or a skill set and not to your culture, I think you run into trouble. When you can create a culture that people want to work in, people will work for less, they will work harder, and they will stay longer. But it takes a lot of work to create that culture. And I think it's one of the things we put on the back burner. Yeah. We tell people it's much better to hire to a cultural fit than it is. You can always teach people a skill. You can't teach them to be trustworthy. You can't teach them to show up on time. You can't teach them to go the extra yard. And so when you can hire the kinds of people who do that 
and you reward them and you show them that this is the kind of place that that they will get recognized for that 100 percent different yeah yeah i agree yeah no there's definitely some evidence also of you know there is just generally a lack of people so you've got a smaller pool you know because you've got baby boomers retiring and all that um you've got a smaller pool of people so it's you know more more than ever people need to come up with a culture and why are we here right and you know it's i don't think it i mean yeah we're talking about profit here today but it's more than that right Mm -hmm. there's more to business than just what's the profit that's one of those things you know you have to i think that's one of the misunderstandings about business is that like you take a non-profit for example and you have all these startups right now in non-profit but a nonprofit still has to make a profit to be sustainable, you know, and so does a business. It's not always about making a pile of money. It's about the business has to survive. And to do that, it needs a profit so that people can get paid, you know, that the lights <laughs> can stay on, all that stuff. So I think your program's a great way to mitigate that. And that's very true. I think the other thing that's happening now is culturally, uh, a lot of people have been told not to do certain kind of work or have been looked down upon for doing that. And I think a lot of times in the trades, we just don't have enough people coming in to, to backfill those that are retiring. And I, I hear that a lot yeah. uh, being yeah. a major issue. Yeah. And so it's almost going out into the community. And the reality is you got to find them when they're young, like 13, yeah. 14, 15 and show them a path forward, show them the way to do things so that you can bring them up and be able to create the workforce for tomorrow. And I think that's one of the biggest struggles we're, we're having. And so we'll see what happens. I, I, I say a good recession solves a lot of problems. And so <laughs> yes, it does. And it weeds out a lot of the bad stuff, right? Um, I, I did a, I happened to do a, did a poll over the weekend on Facebook in a welding group. Um, and I asked a number of questions like, you know, um, what are your biggest struggles at work? And it was, um, you know, fun, keeping and finding good people, finding and keeping good mm -hmm. people. Um, and then it was wages and a bunch of other things. But the, the biggest one was wages, you know, not getting competitive wages. So um with that kind of answer you think okay what's what's going on here right is it that the businesses can't afford to pay these guys well or is it a culture of that's just how everybody thinks i should be making more than um i am actually worth <laughs> and that's the thing about a market it'll tell you what you're actually worth or is it you know that we need to rethink how we you know do these things within companies where we need to allocate a profit and a portion of that needs to go towards wages, right? And, and, you know, I mean, obviously we're not going to starve the business to death, but I'm saying it's a thought process to begin to think about because the, the trades, manufacturing, welding, metals, all this stuff that got offshore that's coming back is critical to our infrastructure. And we can't forget that. So, um yeah, I think that profit first makes sense. And maybe there, what do you think about that? Like as a, as a, a thought process for business owners today, that maybe we need to start thinking about not the, not them as the business owner, but think about your people a little bit more. Well, you do. And that's, it comes back to how do we get more people to be interested in working in the trades? Yeah. How do you pay them appropriately? And, and I think that is a big thing. I, and that's what we heard a lot, especially early on during COVID. If a guy can go or a gal can go work in a warehouse for 22 bucks an hour, because that's the wage they were getting, you've got to pay appropriately. I mean, that's just the reality of it. And yeah. that, I think, pushed up wages for everybody. Yeah. And that's just the struggle you face. And mm -hmm. what are your working conditions like? Is it, you know, how, what are we doing for training and so forth? And how are you recruiting? Because I, I think that is a big problem. And 
it's got to be addressed globally. The small business owner can't change the global perspective, but you can find a handful of people and change their perspective and, and help to create that. I think the other thing is people want more flexibility today. Yeah. So can you create a more flexible employment model um, where people have that as well? And that's, that's what we're seeing happen. So yeah. Yeah, COVID, COVID did show us that. It showed us that people want change and they don't like their jobs and all that stuff. So to get them back, we need to, It's it, you can't just throw your hands up and say, you know, everybody's lazy. And I think it's more than that, right? So cool, man. So what, what drew you to Profit First? What? How did you get involved with that? So I was kind of, more on the personal finance side, helping people who were making money being able to keep it. And along that journey, I started to hear that business owners weren't looking at their finances. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> and, and I realized it was kind of that aha moment. Oh, they went into business not to be a business owner. They went into business to do what they loved. And accounting wasn't on that list. And so I came to the realization that, that business owners like people, which they are, were struggling with their financials. And so at that point, I started looking at different systems to see which was the best one for me to help people implement, or do I create my own system? And as part of that, I realized, number one, I don't want to create my own system. That takes work and effort. I'd rather use somebody else's so I can spend my time doing the parts I love, which is literally looking at spreadsheets. I know I'm geeky that way. Um, <laughs> and tax returns. That's what I like to like. I like to look at numbers because numbers tell me stories yes. and the stories can bring about the change. And so in looking at all the different systems out there, I realized profit first was already the way that I was living my life. It's the way I've always done money. So I was like, okay, this is perfect. It's a good match. Philosophically, we're on the same table. Um, and I also didn't want to get into, I think a lot of some of the systems get way too much in the weeds. Right. And that wasn't where I wanted to be. I don't want to be in the weeds. I want to be kind of helping create the top line strategy and helping people to see and understand where their money is going. Mm -hmm. So it was a perfect fit for us. Cool. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, it's funny, you know, I may have to consult you on this. I'm putting together a, a program myself, which is, you know, the financial end of things and, um, it's it's great. It's a learning process. I love the numbers too. And, um, you know, I've been looking at financials for a long time now just because I love it. I love looking at them because it, and I want to touch on that point where you said it tells you a story. And can we, can you talk about that a little bit more about like, you know, you look at cost of goods sold, you know, as a percentage versus revenue, you know, what does that tell somebody when they're looking at their financials? So when I look at the financials, we're looking for the constraint system. So for example, if, if you look at your cost of goods sold and it's above 70%, I can tell you right now, the business isn't going to survive. Even at 70%, it means you've got a very tight struggle to be able to run the best, the rest of your business on the amount that is left. And so I don't think if you don't know that that's a bad ratio, you can't change it. Mm -hmm. And if you're not watching it, right, during COVID, prices shot up. A lot of people were behind the curve on that. They got caught um, not realizing what was going on because it happened so fast. And so that's part of the constraint system, I think, is, is understanding what those percentages should be at a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about it earlier, you know, buying too much equipment or too fancy trucks. You know, there's money going out the door that's providing zero value. So I, I think it's part of that as well, being able to understand that and, and to make wise choices that, that are there. The other problem is, and this is, I think, where people 
and it drove me up the wall. There is no one accounting report that shows you the health of your business in a way that's understandable. So you say, well, I have a P&L. Well, great. You have a P&L and I love that you have a P&L, but how many times have business owners say, my P&L says I'm profitable and yet I have no cash. So profit is a theory in, in the P&L. It doesn't actually show much how much cash you have in the business. Okay. So that's a problem. You can look at a cash flow report, but it doesn't give you enough information. The truth is the value of the business comes down to the balance sheet. But the problem with the balance sheet is nobody looks at a balance sheet month to month. They always look at it as a snapshot in time because that's what we're told. Well, if you can't see the changes in the balance sheet and what's happening on, you're clueless as to what's happening in your business. So you've got to take all these reports and kind of get different parts of them and piece together what's truly happening. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think Profit First is so good because number one, it's a cash management system. The reality is, as long as you've got cash flowing, your business continues. When the cash stopped, the business stopped. You can be profitable and go out of business. And I think that's what people don't realize. And the accounting reports just aren't designed for us. And that's part of the problem. And I think this is why many business owners struggle. Yeah. So is there a system? I mean, I'm familiar with the DuPont system. I mean, you know, it's a kind of a, a bunch of metrics that you can look at. Um, is there something simpler than that so that somebody can look at, you know, to compare to industry standards, or maybe there's, you know, some, a simple system that somebody can look at that doesn't cost them a lot of money, you know, to compare their financials that they should be looking at regularly? Well, I, I think Profit First does that for you. I, in the book, Mike's got targets. He says, for this size business, this is what the target should be. Right. And it's pretty basic and simple. And if you can, if you can allocate your cash that way and live within those means, then I mm -hmm. think you're good. Yeah. Um, it's not that big a deal. Uh, you know, there's a million different systems out there. They're all they all basically say the same thing, right? At the end of the day, you've got to charge appropriate prices. Yeah. You've got to constrain your input costs. You've got to have efficient labor and systems. Yeah. And you've got to figure out how to put it all together in a way that works. Yeah. And I think you just need awareness. So I'll, I'll tell you a story because this is probably one of the, the best profit first stories that's out there. Love to hear it. Right now, this is kind of taking the country by storm. Have you heard of the Savannah Bananas? No. They are a essentially minor league baseball team. So okay. when you think minor league baseball team, do you think profitable? No, I don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because it's usually like a hobby team or something. They're yeah. always losing money. The Savannah Bananas have packed their stadium. Their tickets are all sold out. They were profitable during COVID when they couldn't hold games. Man, that's amazing. Amazing, right? They When they first started the team, they he read profit first. He looked and he did the basic math and went, this isn't going to work. How do I make it work? And that's the key. Business owners are smart. How do you make it work? He created entertainment because that's why people come to watch baseball, to be entertained, to have fun. They created a culture of fun, right? So talk about this. So they don't worry about employees because they've got stacks of people wanting to come work for them. Imagine going to a baseball game, paying one price, getting all your food, getting to watch the game. Your kids aren't going, can I have, can I have a hot dog? Go get one. Leave me alone. Right? <laughs> they don't do sponsorships like traditional baseball teams. They they change the entire model. Wow. And because of that, they are highly profitable. It's fun. And they're taking the country by storm. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. I well, I'll have to check them out. I mean, I, I had no idea. That's amazing. 
That's cool. But that can be applied to anything, right? It can be. It's the principles of changing the way we do business. Yes. It's having conversations with your customers, right? Nobody's having conversations. Yes. Caring. Nobody's understanding what do they want? What do they need? How can I give it to them in a way that's more appropriate? So think about it. Let's say you have a client and they're ordering stuff constantly at different intervals. Can you change their ordering process to make it easier for both of you? This is win-win, right? Can you help them figure out what their needs are and be able to meet them in a way that allows you to have good production flow and that allows your client to have what they need when they need it. And so it's, it's that thinking and that questioning that I think changed the game. And you can apply it to anything. Yeah. The problem is we don't sit down and ask the questions and we don't challenge our conventional way of doing business. Yes. The people who do are the ones who make the money. That's right. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And I've been on the other side and I know that there's fear around it too. There's a fear of being perceived differently, not being a part of the group. And, you know, that fear, what would you say to pushing through that fear of, well, they're going to see me differently and maybe that's going to, and affect my business in a bad way. Well, what, what do you think about that? I mean, I don't think. I, if they see you differently, then you have premium pricing, right? You have the ability to do that. And it's not even necessarily premium pricing. Let's just say that, you know, the client's making all these orders. You're shipping multiple boxes. Well, what if you could ship a pallet? I mean, clearly it's it's a lot cheaper to ship a pallet than to ship all the multiple boxes. You're, I, I think the key there is to understand your clients and to help them to be more profitable by streamlining their systems, which then allows you to be more profitable. And I think that's happening in a lot of industries. It's yeah. going into the other organization and understanding how your products are used and the timeliness of it and the order of it and saying to them, hey, if you do these things differently, right, then you'll have better flow. You'll be more profitable. I'll be more profitable. We all can grow together. That's right. It's a win-win collaboration. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's definitely a shift happening where instead of competition fighting each other, we can collaborate with people, do joint ventures. You know, you offer this thing. Well, we offer this thing. Why don't we bring them together and we both offer something that nobody else has seen, right? I think that is, I hope that's where things are going. I believe that uh, some are doing it, but others need to get on the bandwagon. But anyway, that's that's funny. Everybody's got their own journey, right? So everyone's got their own journey. The better you can do that, though, the more collaborative you can be with your clients it, it makes you be the only one, right? Yeah. Now there's no longer competition. That's now right. they can't just challenge you on pricing alone. Uh -huh. But you've got to take the time to do that and to show them a better way. And I think yeah. that's the problem. We don't take the time to do that. A lot of business owners don't even understand what they're selling like, no, and that, why. That's right. The why is the key thing, right? Why are we here? And the people making the things need to understand why they're doing these things right mm -hmm. and maybe they don't know why and that's the thing is sometimes it's not easy to to identify you have to sit down and think about it you know <laughs> what got me here well i did it for myself why did i start this business well because i knew i could do it better than the, than the guy before me but it's more than that it's deeper than that you know we're serving a service to our clients because they're part of the community. Uh, they're part of my community. I care about them. And, you know, that can be reciprocated, right? So, yeah, cool, man. Um, I had another question and I blank lined again. <laughs> That's twice. I know. What the hell is that all about? Um, you got to write them down. I Well, I did, but anyway, yeah. sometimes I can't. I've got, I've got all my questions <laughs> answered, but then things come to me and it's like, uh <laughs> 
Um, yeah. So, okay, cool, man. Well, I really, this has been great. I, uh, I wanted to, I remember my question now. So revenue related to profit, because one of the first things that we all hear basics one-on-one of marketing and sales is let's increase the revenue, right? How are the revenue and profit different from each other? Like, it doesn't always mean that one goes up and the other goes up as well. Can you explain I, that? I, I have a book back here. It's called Islands of Profit in a Sea of Red Ink. It's Jonathan Burns, MIT professor, right? Smart guy? Yeah, maybe. He looked at large corporations. Yeah. He said, if you look at a large corporation, 30% of what they do is highly profitable. 30 to 40% of what they do loses money. And the remaining stuff is break even. He goes, if you can figure out where your 30% is highly profitable, we can cut revenue, right? And make more money because, and do less. The problem we run into is if I am the president of a company on the stock market and I go to my shareholders and go, hey, we're going to cut sales by 50% next quarter, but don't worry. I, I saw that face. Don't worry. We're going to be three times more profitable. He, he's going to get fired. Right? But yet, ask yourself a question. If I could work half as much and be paid twice as much, would I do it? Well, then figure out how to do that yeah. because it's possible. Yeah. And I think it's just so non-conventional thinking because everyone says, what do we need to do? Grow the top line. But maybe not. I, in my mastermind group last week, the conversation came up. It's like, should I grow my business? Like, why am I growing my business? Is this ego? And he's like, the one guy said to me, he said, keep it small, keep it all. And even today, the conversation came up. It's like, why, why are we growing to all these heights when at the end of the day, you know, let's say I've got a business and it's doing $100 million and I'm taking home half a million, right? What if I had a business that was doing $10 million and I was keeping a million? What would I rather have? And too often we chase the vanity number, which is top line. Yes. We don't chase the reality number, which is the bottom line. And we don't focus on cash flow. And I think the people who are smart enough to do this, and it's a small percentage of business owners. That's why 10 years out, most businesses are gone. And it's because most people aren't paying attention to the numbers to the cash and to thinking it through. And if you do that, you can work less and make more, which is why you went into business, right? Yeah. We didn't go into business to work harder and make less. That's right, which does seem to happen a lot. So it happens cash, all the time. It happens all the time. And it's awful. Um, cash, I mean, cash flow, I mean, income, or sorry, excuse me, profit on your P&L versus cash flow. I mean, what are some things can affect that cash flow? So what happens on your P&L and the things that are missing are um, owner distributions. They don't show up on a P&L. Big one, loan payments. Loan payments do not show up on a P&L except for the actual interest. And it really depends how good your bookkeeper is and whether they're even splitting out the interest mm -hmm. or whether they're just putting the loan to the balance sheet. So what happens is the cash disappears on the balance sheet, right? It's generated on the P&L, but it disappears on the balance sheet. And if you're not tying those two together and understanding that, that's why you're struggling. And I'll be honest, when I look at most small businesses, they don't even create a balance sheet. They're like, what? What, what's that all about? Why do I even need to do that? Yeah. But that's the reality of what happens. So I think a lot of cash disappears into places that are not showing up on the, on the P&L. And that's the problem. That's why Profit First is such a great system, because it's following the cash in your bank account. Okay. And it's doing it in real time. 
So you say, hey, I, I put this system together. I started doing my allocations. Two months later, the biggest thing that's going to happen is my operating expenses ran out. Yeah, because you're spending too much. And now you've really got to sit down and think, where did all the money go? And how do I stop making it go there? Yeah. And it gives you that early gut check of what's happening. Because too often it gets stuck in different places. You buy a truck, okay, you know, that doesn't show up on the P&L. It shows up on the balance sheet. And that's the problem. All those equipment purchases, they're not showing up. Even inventory, depending on how you do accounting, your inventory may not show up on the balance sheet, on the P&L. It shows up on the balance sheet. Yeah. And so you don't see it. You may like, I don't have any cash. You may not have cash, but you got a million dollars of inventory that's gone stale because you didn't take care of your inventory or it all turned into scrap because somebody made a mistake. Where do mistakes show up on the P&L, right? They don't. But if you're making mistakes in your production, it's all disappearing and it's being able to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. So uh, here's here's another thing that I see all the time. Um, you've got fixed costs versus variable costs, which is, you know, your cost of goods sold and your expenses. And they're allocating people in the wrong places. Can you give us kind of an idea of what should be happening when you're allocating your variable costs, like in your P&L um, and your fixed costs? What should be going in each one of those? Your, your variable costs are usually tied to production. So variable costs could be the actual material going into it. Mm -hmm. Variable costs could be if, if you're using a ton of energy to create that. So if you've got to use a bunch of electric to run all your equipment, then your, your variable cost of electric is the additional production. But even if you didn't produce anything, you still got to keep the lights off and on in the office. So you've got a portion, a portion that's fixed. I think it's just being aware for a lot of business owners. What's my monthly nut? What do I need to make no matter what? And being aware of that number. What do I need to do just to keep the lights on in the building? And what is that fixed cost every month? And, and just being aware of it. And yeah. I think too often in order, sometimes we get behind on sales and in order to get sales, we discount and we don't realize mm. the discount actually just made us unprofitable. So mm. while cash came in the door today, tomorrow, it's actually going to go out the door faster because I made that sale because I was unprofitable. And that even comes back to AR and um, accounts receivable, accounts payable, making sure you're getting paid when you're supposed to be getting paid. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times recently I've had services done. Nobody sent me a bill. Hmm. I'm like, D how do you expect to stay in business? Yeah, exactly. Like I asked for the bill multiple times. I don't get a bill. I'm like, <laughs> what, wow. what is going on? That's small businesses, service providers. That's just what they don't. Let's face it. They're doing what they love. Sending out bills is not a high on the list. Yes. They don't have systems and processes. Yes. Are you making sure you're getting paid? Because the reality is if you don't get paid in 30 days, your chances of getting paid gets slimmer and slimmer. Yes. Or if you deliver something and they go out of business, that's a major loss to you. So making mm -hmm. sure that you're not giving credit to people who are not credit worthy. We get yeah. excited about the new sale yeah. and then we sell something and then we don't get paid. Well, there's a cash problem. <laughs> there's absolutely a cash problem. So I, I want to pick your brain here. Um, you know, in a lot of traditional industries, we see um, working on credit, right? And, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, sometimes 120, depending on the client. What do you think the chances are of ever getting to being paid all up front? Is that ever going to happen in some of, I mean, some industries are that way now. Do you think we could ever get there in some of the traditional industries? Every industry is different and there are certain 
there's certain expectations within each industry, right? Of how that particular industry works. The reality is I think you need to look at your business and say, if I'm going to get into a 120-day payment cycle, am I pricing for a 121-day payment cycle? B, how am I going to cover the cash flow for 120 days? And knowing that up front, because if you don't, you can't, if you're in that type of a behind cash cycle, you can't grow your business super fast. Because if you grow it too fast, you're going to run into the cash cycle not keeping up. And if you don't have the cash for growth, you're going to implode. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. So even though you're doing the right things and you're profitable, the fact that you didn't have the cash to fund the growth, you implode. Where on the other hand, when you've got places, and it's funny because I was reading something the other day, they had a business on the other side of that. So think about, let's reverse it. I'm in a business where I get stuff today and I don't have to pay for it for 120 days. Yeah. Well, if I can buy something today and I can sell it for cash in 30 days, I'm sitting on 90 days of cash, which means the faster I grow my business, the more money I have. That's right. But somebody's financing it, which is the other guy. Okay. So I think you have to appropriately price for it. Yeah. You have to have terms. You have to have systems and controls to make sure you're actually getting paid at 120 because 120 turns into 150 turns into 180. Yeah. Absolutely. Companies that companies that pay like that and industries that get paid like that, usually it means that your customers in a cash crunch. Right. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, either that or they're in control of a market has been my experience. You know, we're mm-hmm. taking, I'm not going to say the name of it, but, you know, a large multinational conglomerate, conglomerate, you know, pays that way um, yeah. because they, they all can. do. They can because they can. So maybe you shouldn't go do business with them. Right. Go yeah. figure out a different business model. And we tell that to people all the time because people, oh, I want to get my product in Costco. OK, you want to get your product in Costco means I have to buy the materials today cash out the door. I have to build the product, cash out the door. So here I am 60 days in, I finally deliver my product to Costco. And I don't know their exact payment terms, but let's say they pay out 90 days. Mm-hmm. I'm already 60 behind. Now I've got a 90 on top of it. 45 days in, Costco gives me another order. hmm now I've got to go 60 behind again. Yeah. Plus, and, and if that's what I think people don't realize. If you're in a business that requires cash for growth, you better figure out how to get cash to fund your growth, or you're gonna you're gonna grow yourself out of business. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And all the more reason to do and be unique because mm-hmm. you know, if you can differentiate yourself in a market, um, you know, you may be able to get paid faster and you can charge more for it, you know, which accounts for those problems. Well, think about it. If you're, if you're serving a fortune 500 and you can do something that they're going to need immediately, then you can say, Hey, if you want it, I can do it immediately, but pay me now. Yeah. And because of that, you can probably charge them 10 X because nobody in that corporate office cares how much your stuff costs they only care about solving the problem and so they'll authorize the money because to them it's chump change because they're so big and so but you have to change your mindset to understand that yeah yeah absolutely well it's been a pleasure rocky look at where can people find you because you're a wealth of knowledge obviously (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so where can people find you online and offline and all that stuff? Well, maybe not offline, but online. <laughs> Before you come find me, would you do me a favor? If you like what Greg's doing, would you like his stuff? Would you share it? Would you give him a little bit of love? It's, you know, he's not hearing your, your voice back if you're not doing that. So it's a nice, easy way to say thank you to Greg. Well, thank you. Uh, 
you are most welcome. If you'd like to find me, uh, my website is Profit Comes First. Everything we do for our clients, we teach and we talk about on the podcast, which is Profit Answer Man. So if you want to hear more of these things, how they apply to different industries yeah. and in the different principles, we teach everything about Profit First for free. We give it all away on, on the podcast. And then if you want to chat, you know, you can look at the, the website has our contact information. We've got programs for any type of business owner, wherever you are in the, in the spectrum, we've got something to help you to be more profitable and have a growing business. That's beautiful, man. Well, thank you. Look, and I'm going to be reaching out because I would like to talk to you about some other things. Um, that's what it's all about, right? Networking. So appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you, Rocky. We'll talk to you soon. Greg Sheldon here, your host of Metal Steel Manufacturing and Business Pro Podcast, where you learn everything about the metals and manufacturing industry that make your modern day life possible.